In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Again, for today, like we did yesterday, we're going to be foregoing our normal, regularly scheduled Chaplain's Report because I think that with where our country is right now, we could probably use a different message. Uh, not that the messages in the chaplain's report normally would be inappropriate, just I think that maybe we can do something that's a little more timely, a little bit more specific. And one thing that I was thinking about the other day, because a lot of people have been asking me, what would the Bible have to say about this whole situation with the way that we're going to deal with our brothers and sisters in the church, the way that we handle and, and put on a, a public face in front of other people to represent the church? What would the Bible have to say about this entire situation? Well, the thing is, Obviously, we know that the Bible teaches in multiple different places, and I went into great detail on this on yesterday's Chaplain's Report, that racism is obviously wrong, and that really stems from the idea that we are all brothers and sisters, that God created all of us and created us equally. You can see stories where racism does come into effect in the Scripture, where it, it, it always paints it in a negative light. Uh, you could go back to the way that some of the, the Greek Jews back in the New Testament were not being taken care of, and the church readily saw to and, and made sure that they were going to be taken care of, and there, there was not any uh, racial bias going on with who was being helped, the widows and the orphans that needed that assistance, that kind of thing. We have passages, for example, in the epistles in, Gentile, in, in Galatians where it says that there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, all are one in Christ. And so that's the obvious part of that, but I want us to really go deeper when it comes to specifically what happened with George Floyd, Christians do have an obligation to speak out against evil. And I've been very happy to see and proud of a lot of my Christian brothers and sisters speaking out against this evil. And so that's one thing. I, I do think that if you remain silent, it doesn't necessarily mean you're doing anything wrong, or maybe you're just trying to stay out of it for different reasons. I don't think that automatically that means that you are standing silent in the face of evil, partially because everybody pretty much already agrees with this one anyway. But I do think that Christians have an obligation to call out the killing of uh, George Floyd or anybody else that has been abused by somebody in power, regardless of what the relationship is, regardless of what the skin color is. That's always the right thing to do. It's always right to speak out against evil things being done. However, I think that one thing that we need to keep in mind is that the virtue that racism is against, the reason that racism is wrong, is because it disturbs unity. You see, each vice, each thing that is talked about as a sin, it is in some way a perversion of something that works against a virtue. So, for example, lying is wrong because it is against honesty. Honesty is a value that God holds in high esteem. And because he does, something that would be going against that virtue, in this case, lying, would be something that is wrong. The same thing is true here. It's obviously correct to denounce racism. However, racism is not the only way in which unity can be broken. In the same way that lying is not the only way you could be dishonest. You could also cheat, you could also do a number of other things. In the same way, you could have somebody that absolutely is not a racist and holds no racial animus towards anybody, and yet still is not somebody that holds unity in high regard, or even somebody that works against unity in the church, somebody that causes there to be divisions. There could be no racial aspect to it whatsoever, but it would still not be upholding that virtue which unity, or sorry, that racism tries to break down, which of course, like I've said, is unity. And so we need to be concerned not only, not only with the sin of racism, but also with what we should be working toward, not just what we should be working to avoid. And what we should be working toward, ultimately, is unity. Now, I want you to think about this verse that comes from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs verse 6, verses, or sorry, chapter 6, verses 16 
through 19, and you can see there, There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among the brothers. Now, I want you to think about that list. A God, a God that is the literal embodiment of love, as we learn in Scripture. There are certain things that He does hate. He doesn't hate people, but He does hate some of the evil things that people do. And here is a list, not a comprehensive or exhaustive list, but a pretty good summary of certain things that God hates. And the way that it's worded right there in the Bible, the way that the poet, the author of Proverbs, in this case Solomon, at least he pins this portion of Proverbs, the reason that Solomon puts it this way says there are six things that, God's ha- that God hates, seven. He is putting emphasis on the seventh thing. And the seventh thing that he puts up is somebody who sows strife or discord, whatever your translation may say, among brothers, somebody that stirs up trouble. Now, racism is obviously evil and wrong. The riots that have resulted from the protest have obviously been evil or wrong. doesn't mean the protests themselves were wrong, but it does mean that the riots, which have been connected to them, have obviously been wrong, whether it was stealing, hurting people, whatever. There's a lot of evil associated with those riots. You see, what's interesting here, though, is that You could call out those things and denounce them, but you could also not be striving for that perfect bond of unity, which the Scripture tells us to try to aspire to. There have been an awful lot of brethren, and it has been very disheartening to see them go at one another and attack one another. And I understand, sometimes you've you've got arguments, you've got disputes. If you have a brother or sister that you believe is in error, it is correct and biblically sound to try to call them out on that, to call them back to repentance. Those are things that are good. But I'm afraid that a lot of the fighting may be done in a way that is not beneficial and may even fall into the category that we see here in Proverbs, something that God hates, something that if it's something that's petty, if it's not something that is necessary or essential, if it's not something that is going to affect them it, it, or, or not affect the, the status of their soul, any of those things, because sometimes these things could result in some of those things. If you had somebody, for example, that was condoning evil behavior, let's say if you had somebody that was actually literally condoning Floyd's killer, and what he did, or you had somebody that was condoning the riots. Okay, well, that's a brother you need to talk to. That's somebody that has some serious underlying spiritual issues, condoning that which is evil. That, that's a problem. So I'm not saying there can't be legitimate arguments that crop up out of this, but I'm saying whenever we have any of these discussions, especially the difficult ones, we need to constantly remind ourselves that we are fighting not only against things like racism, but toward unity. And if we're not fighting toward unity, then the other fights don't matter all that much. If what we're doing is not helping us move towards unity and reconciliation, then what are we doing? That's what we're called to do ultimately, isn't it? Now, obviously, you don't go for fake unity. Like I just said, if there's a brother that has a real problem, if there's an issue there, then that is a discussion that needs to be had. You don't just ignore problems in the name of unity. But you also don't specifically go out of your way to try to stir up strife and controversy. And if it is a fight that is going to damage your relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ then you have to ask yourself a serious question if that fight is actually worth having. Maybe it is. I think you have to judge that on a case-by-case basis. But if it's something that is causing a lack of unity, then you have to ask yourself, is the fight that important? Because if it's not, it's probably better to abandon it. And so I think that we would all do a great deal of service to one another and to the kingdom as a whole if we just keep this in mind and try to remember that we need to 
always be striving for unity. Watch out for people that aren't. Because if you run across people that are not striving for unity, that aren't looking for reconciliation, that do not want there to be this perfect bond of unity between people, whether it's racial issues, uh, whether it's how much money people make, any of those stupid, you know, trivial things that we have to worry about here on this earth. If there's ever somebody that is trying to create disunity, you need to be on the guard for those people because those people will cause a church to break down. It can only tolerate so much of it. And after a while, and unless just about everybody, if not a vast majority, everyone is really needed to accomplish that goal of unity. And the thing is that we have to be aware of as well. It can be both intentional and unintentional, which means just because you're not specifically going out there trying to create disunity, trying to stir up strife, doesn't mean you aren't. And I say this from my own perspective because I have to ask myself this question from time to time. Is having this fight really worth it? Is doing this, if it's going to hurt my unity with my brethren, is it something that is so spiritually important that this fight has to be fought out? And so, even if you have the best of intention, that does not mean you're not contributing to a lack of unity. And so you really do have to examine yourself and ask yourself those questions. Because ultimately, if we are not striving for the perfect bond of unity, we are not living like Christ did. Because he strived for unity between his followers and his disciples, but he also strove for unity with us. That ultimately, the sacrifice on the cross, what that was supposed to do, what it was meant to do, is to bring us back into unity with both him and his Father. And if we have somehow missed all of that, if we somehow discard unity as something that's not that important or our own pride or being right or whatever else it is that is motivating us to have a fight that doesn't really matter or to sow some kind of discord among the brethren, whether it's because we see them as, as not part of our group or whatever else it is, then we're not living up to the calling of being like Christ. That should be a sobering thought to all of us, that that is something that we are held accountable to as well. Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.